gonna let you guys teach. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Y'all got it? Yeah. Because I know you've read ahead, so you know exactly where we're headed. And you, and you know the chapter and the verse and all that, and you look scared to death. <laughs> Nothing like striking fear into the hearts of people. Um, I'm going to be very open and honest with you. Right now my brain is mush. Like, and so when I was writing out my notes, you know, I start on my Bible study notes like Thursday morning after I've taught on Wednesday. But I don't write it down because if I do, I'd, I would hold y'all hostage forever. And um, nobody wants that. So when it came to putting this on paper, I was like, Lord, I need something new and fresh that's never been heard before. That didn't happen for me. <laughs> so I was kind of um, aggravated because I'm used to things just blowing up you know, in my mind whenever I read. And I'm like, that's just, that's amazing. I never saw that before. And, and um, it's wonderful revelation. And I realized that sometimes the, the basic truths that we already know kind of get pushed to the backdrop just a little bit. And, and we forget because we're focused on learning the new things that we kind of forget the old ways. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I, I thought that was kind of interesting that that just kind of clicked at the same time I was having this, this brain cloud of whatever it is that's happening in my head. So tonight is probably not going to be super deep. It's probably not going to be very long. So those who have had car difficulties and, and all that kind of stuff, hopefully they'll make it as we close tonight. Um, so our Bible study last week ended in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we watched King Saul imagine that there was a threat against him. He, everything that he thought was attacking him was in his mind. And I think that is very interesting because in the Old Testament we can see battlegrounds. We see actual battles. We see wars. We see people fighting and, and swords clashing and, and the shields up there protecting each other and all that kind of stuff. And you see a stronghold. You see uh, Jericho had a stronghold that nobody could get in, nobody could get out. They had the walls built up, very literal walls built up. And in the New Testament, most of that's gone. But the Bible still talks about strongholds. But there's not really fighting and battles. Now it's the church, and it's not just a, a nationality or a group of people. It's the church, which encompasses everybody. So where are the strongholds? They're the same kind of strongholds we saw in the Old Testament, but now they are more mental and spiritual strongholds than they are actual physical strongholds. Yeah. Now the difficulty with that is that when you're in a battle and you're trying to break into a city and conquer it, you can see the walls. Right. And they're obvious. Like, you know you've got to get from point A to point B, and there's a wall in the way. It's there. You can see it. But when you're praying and you're trying to go into this place and you're trying to touch God in this special way, and it feels like your prayers are hitting the ceiling and come back and hitting you in the face, but you don't see a wall. Yeah. It's different. But just like every one of Saul's difficulties were made up in his mind, a lot of times our strongholds are things that oppress the mind. They're not, nobody is holding you captive and keeping you from praying. Nobody's making you respond to a situation in a certain way. Those are all things that we decide to do, and we do that first in our mind, right? Right. Because we have made up our mind. Okay. So David um, was... Saul's enemy, but he wasn't. He respected Saul. He had to, to go back to him after Saul tried to kill him once, twice, three times. It, I mean, either you'd have to be really dumb or devoted. That's right. you got to be loyal or a little bit off. Yep. One or the other to keep going back. So Saul had become paranoid of David's fame because he thought that everyone esteemed David more than they did Saul. And so the spirit had left Saul because he disobeyed over and over again. And when there was an opportunity for repentance, he didn't take it. Yeah. Jonathan had seen this. 
Now, I think this is amazing because Saul's history, he had been anointed by God. Yeah. He had been in the presence of God. He had prophesied under the anointing of God. He had acted like he was supposed to in past times, and Jonathan had seen that. But he's also seen his dad backslide. And he's seen his dad not put the kingdom first, but instead put his own reputation and his own fame and fortune and whatever in the forefront. And Jonathan knew that that wasn't right. Jonathan knew that the kingdom was supposed to be about the king of kings and not his bloodline. Yeah. And so he had to... He had to switch his allegiance, and he made a covenant with David um, because he recognizes David's anointing. Now, I think it's amazing that Jonathan is not jealous at all of David. He protects David when David is about to replace him. Yeah. Yeah. That could preach because later on, you're going to see David in a place where he wants to build this temple for the Lord. He wants to build this tabernacle. Yeah. But he can't. Because God said, that's not for you to do. That's for your son to do. Right. And when David could have been jealous, like Jonathan could have been jealous of David, David says, okay, that's not my calling. I'm not supposed to build this tabernacle, but I'm going to do everything I can to set my son up and prepare him to where he can build it. He supported him when he was denied what he wanted to do. Yeah. That, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Okay, and it's a rabbit trail. So Saul had given David what seemed like an impossible task at the end of last week's lesson. Uh, or I guess it was last week. Um, it was, he was hoping that the Philistines would knock David out, like he would, they would get rid of him. They, uh, he sent him after this job to bring back 100 skin trophies from the Philistines as a dowry in order to marry Saul's daughter, Michal. That shouldn't have gone well for David, okay? But it did, and he actually brought back 200 skins instead of 100, and Saul hated him even more because it was pretty obvious that God was with him. And there's nothing more aggravated to someone who has walked away from the presence of God than to see God anoint somebody else. That jealousy and that hatred is deep. And so in Saul's backslidden state, he was more about hating David's current position than he was going into repentance himself on what's wrong, what needs to change. Let me look at the mirror and see what needs to happen in my life. Yeah. So tonight we're going to pick up our story in chapter 19. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 2. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. I mean, that's pretty cut and dry right there. Yeah. Like, hey, Jonathan, go kill him. Yeah. There's no question about it. Y'all need to kill him. Verse 2, But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself unto the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. He took his own life in his hands to warn David that his dad was crazy and he was coming after him. So this account begins a very tense road between Saul and David. Um, we know that he's already at least once thrown a javelin at David and either missed or has poor eyesight, something, somehow David lived through it and got out, okay? There's already tension there. But now, as Saul is conspiring to kill David, David seems to have more resources to escape. And what is amazing about this account is that every time Saul, like, ups the ante a little bit, he, like, goes a little bit further in trying to catch David, it's like David just skirts on right past it just a little bit more. Like, nothing phases him. <laughs> I'm kind of reminded of, like, Tom and Jerry or the roadrunner and the coyote, <laughs> yeah. you know, no matter what they try, you know, you would think after watching those cartoons, like as a child, you would know not to order anything from the acne company. It's going to go bad, <laughs> yeah. but they keep doing it. Well, that's kind of how Saul was. He keeps making these bad decisions over and over again, but he's not learning a lesson. And so now you've got all this tension between Saul and David, and it's becoming clear to others 
that Saul is trying to kill David. Yeah. So now it's not just David thinking, you know, I think Saul's got something against me. I may be wrong, and I'm kind of thinking it wasn't an accident that that javelin slipped out of his hand and hurled toward my head. Right. You know, I hate to think bad of, of people, but, you know, I was the only one in that room. <laughs> so, you know, I, I kind of think he was after me. But now it's not just David. Now other people are starting to notice. Now, let me just throw this in there. If you're in the right and you're walking the way God has ordered your steps, and there are people out to get you, because that's a real thing and that happens, right. let God have the vengeance, because he will reveal what's happening yeah. at some point. Trust yeah. him with that. And that's, that's a hard thing to do, because we want to justify ourselves. That's right. And there is nothing more frustrating than to be able to justify yourself and tell your part of the story and knowing that you're not supposed to. <laughs> right. Mm. Right, right, right. right. I have failed that test, and I have also passed that test. And I can tell you that passing that test was hard. Yeah. yeah. Hard. It's a lot easier to say, well, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> right. um, so there have been times when I've not said anything, and there have been times when I have, and I shouldn't have. So that let God fight your battles when it comes to that. So now other people are starting to see what Saul is doing to get David. And this is amazing. God creates allies for David in Saul's family. Yeah. People who should be loyal to Saul are coming out and supporting David. Yeah. So we saw how Jonathan has sworn this allegiance and he's made this covenant with David. Now Michael, or Michael, David's wife, Saul's daughter, is also going to ally with him. So let me very briefly go over the events. And I say briefly, I may be lying. I don't really know. But I'm going to go over the accounts that happen in this chapter, okay? So... I probably won't give you every verse in here, but it's all in chapter 19. Y'all know, read the whole book, it'll do you good, but it's in chapter 19, okay? Um, after Jonathan warns David to go and hide, he returns to his father, and he starts to butter him up. He's like, you know, why are you so mad at David? You know, he went out and fought the Philistines for you, and he's won, and, and we're in a good spot right now, and David's really not that bad, and he really likes you. Dad, you know, who I was listening to him the other day, and he was talking about King Saul this and King Saul that. Yeah, he just thinks the world of you. Yeah. And eventually Saul kind of softened a little bit, and Jonathan was able to at least persuade him not to kill David for a moment. Um, it, it, only, it only lasts for a little bit. But anyway, he talks sense into him. And then Jonathan goes after David the very next morning, after the threat on his life, and he brings them back to Saul's house, okay? So David's got to trust Jonathan in order to go back with him. Yeah. So that covenant is kind of playing through here. So then another war breaks out with the Philistines, and David goes out to fight. And when he returns, so does the evil spirit that is afflicting Saul. It's kind of interesting because we know that David was very successful in his battles against the Philistines, and it seems to be that part of that is what sparks this paranoia and animosity and, you know, big madness that Saul seems to go through. And that seems to spark the openness for the evil spirit. I, I want to be clear on that, that it's jealousy and paranoia that opened Saul for the evil spirit. Yeah. Not the evil spirit that opens Saul for paranoia and jealousy. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have that first step. Right. It, it's what we introduce ourselves to that makes us vulnerable That's to right. that thing. So as David plays his heart because the evil spirit is back on Saul, Saul watches him while holding a javelin. <laughs> He's just sitting there holding it. You know, probably got it up like this. He's just watching it. Can you imagine trying to play the harp on somebody staring at you with a javelin in their hand? Yeah. You know, you're just like, <laughs> yeah. You know, you're looking for the closest exit. You're like trying to figure out if you can get under the table if necessary. Probably hitting some wrong notes. <laughs> oh, scared to death, shaking a little bit. I can't even imagine. 
Like Brother Woodward said, if you surround yourself with javelins, you will eventually throw them. That's the nature of man. Um, as we covered last week, some, some applicable things that we keep in our life, sometimes it's our side of the story. Yeah. <laughs> well, one day, everyone will know. That's right. yeah. And that's a, a nice little javelin that one day will go into the air. We're just waiting for the time. I've given it to the Lord. I'm letting him fight my battles. But when he releases me, <laughs> but when it's my time, you know, and, and that's kind of, um, that, that's silly, but it's an applicable truth. Because when we hold things, when we hold revenge, when we hold bitterness, when we hold frustration, when we hold, anyway, eventually they get chunked through the air. So, he does throw the javelin at David, and David, David escapes again. And um, he escapes into the night. Now, this time, Saul's kind of just a little bit more bold on his attack toward David. It has been so far, he's either tried to get the Philistines to kill him, or in his own private quarters, he has chunked a javelin at his head. Hasn't been a public display. He really hasn't gotten a lot of other people involved in it. It's just been his own anger and hatred and almost spontaneity that has, has attacked. But now he's going to step out and not really care who he hurts. He's involving his own family in this revenge or this attack. And he actually sends soldiers or messengers to David's house where he and Saul's daughter live, Michal. Now that, that's, can you imagine? Like somebody knocking on the door, and, you know, here's this lady, yes. It's your dad's soldiers. We're here to kill your husband. <laughs> but I thought dad liked him. <laughs> and so Michael actually hears of this plan and she warns David. And so she's like, David, listen, dad is going to kill you. You got to get out the window, hide, run. You got to get out of here because it's going to be that. And so David does. Michael actually helps him escape out the window. It's very romantic. I can just see her tying sheets together, and he's like jimmying down the sheets, you know, to get out and get free. That's probably all in my head. I don't think that's Bible, but it does say he went out the window. And so after the, um, the great escape, yeah. Michael, or Michael, lays a statue in David's bed. She even puts, like, goat hair or something on it. She, like, takes the sheets, and she wraps it up around him to where it kind of like we used to do when we wanted mom to think we were in bed when she peeked in to check and see if we were asleep. You know, all those pillows and all of a sudden the six-year-old is like this wide and this long because it's every pillow in the house shoved under the blankets. Yeah. So that's what she does. She makes it look like there is somebody sleeping in the covers. And I love this. You can't make this up, guys. Okay, this is, this is Bible. It's in chapter 19. She lays the statue in the bed and she covers it up so it looks like her husband. And when the soldiers come in, the messengers come in with this very clear attack. We're here to get your husband. we got to take him back. We're going to kill him. And she's like, oh, no, you know what? Today's not really a good day for that. He's sick. He's in bed. <laughs> yeah. And the soldiers are like, oh, okay. And they leave. Yeah. It's in chapter 19. Check it out. And so they go back to Saul, and they're like, um, we couldn't kill him. He's in bed. He's sick. <laughs> and Saul's like. Bring him here, sick or not. Bring the whole bed. I don't care. Pick the bed up. Take it with you. Bring him here so I can kill him. And they're like, oh, <laughs> Let's, yeah, should have thought of that. Yeah. And so they go back to Michael's house again. By this time, David's got a pretty good head start, and he's running, and, you know, and he's, he's out of there. And so the messengers go back to see David. <laughs> um. I did write that verse down. I don't know. He said, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. So bring the whole bed and everything and I'll kill him. Okay. And so when the soldiers return to get David, sick or not, they pull back the blankets and they see the statue. Can you imagine how dumb they must have felt? Number one, that they, they bought the sick <laughs> excuse and just didn't. I guess you can't kill a sick man. And then number two, when they go back and it's just a statue. I may be wrong, but I'm thinking that they probably became like the royal toilet cleaners after that. I don't really think that they kept a military lived. position. If they even lived. If they lived, that's right. I don't, I'm surprised they lived after they went back and said we couldn't get him. He was sick. Yeah. Bye. Anyway, in 
And so Saul is so angry. He is angry that David got away. But he's also angry that his daughter, Michal, helped. Yeah. And so she asked, or he asked her, he's like, what in the world? Why have you deceived me? Why did you help David get away? Now, this is very interesting because at this point, it says that Michal loved David. But she was raised by Saul. She was faithful to David, but she had been instructed by a liar. There are some things, imagine if she were 18 when they got married. That's 18 years of influence of watching mom and daddy's ways, yeah. of picking up some little habits here and there. And she watched as Saul blamed the people every time something went wrong. Yep. Well, I had to do the sacrifice because the people wanted me to do it. It wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. I had to do this because they made me do it. It was the soldiers. They did all that all on their own. You know, I couldn't stop them. And so somewhere in Michael's head, her first response became, let me lie and cover myself. Let me protect me. And so she lied to cover herself, and she told her dad, he threatened to kill me if I didn't help him escape. And Saul's so like, oh, well, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I see why you, okay, you're good. At this point, David had done everything he could to keep the peace with Saul, okay? He put himself in danger two, three, four, five times. It wasn't like, well, if that's the way they're going to act, then on them. He didn't have an attitude about it. He was still humble. Yeah. But it was clear that if he stayed in the palace, he was not going to live. And God had a calling on his life. His soul was hurting, and he felt alone. According to historians, it was during this time that David actually wrote Psalms 59. And I, I love this because I don't know if you've ever noticed, but most of our Bibles will have like a song for the lead musician right. or a song from Cora on the day that such and such happened. The reason for that is because those psalms or songs were put together in the time frame of when they happened to give credit and context back to when they happened, okay? Like, for instance, when we hear, um, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. It is accredited to David that he said that right after he buried his infant son. Because he was unclean. He had touched the body of a dead child. And he couldn't go into the house of the Lord until the next day when he was purified. And so after he washed himself and he shaved and he, he did all of those things and he cleansed himself, he was excited to go back into the house of the Lord. Even though he had just gone through this grievous time. So in Psalms 59, um, the introduction of the psalm actually says, When Saul sent men, and they watched the house in order to kill him. So in Psalms 59, David takes his case before God. He says, deliver me from my enemies, O God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. And then he said, he describes his attacker. He said, they lay in wait for my life. They growl like a dog. It's interesting because in that chapter, it tells us that Saul sent the men to get them before they told him he was sick and they couldn't get him. And they were supposed to lay outside and wait for him to either come out or wait until morning or whatever. He gave him a time frame. He said, go out there and just wait for him, like intimidate him, be there. Um, he says, they belch out with their mouth, swords are their lips. They're taunting him. David declares his innocence. He said, not for my transgression nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare, them, they run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. I didn't do nothing, yeah. but yet they're out to kill me. Right. Listen, I, I want to just, let me just say this for a second, okay? It is false teaching for anybody to tell you that you cannot be upset about a situation. <laughs> you can trust God and know he's in charge and still be big mad about a situation. Yep, that's right. Okay? Let me give you an example. I trust God. I love God. I know there is forgiveness and redemption and restoration for people who have made bad decisions in their life. But abortion makes me mad. Mm 
Okay? Yeah. Yep. And that's okay. If you read through the accounts of David, God gave us emotions and, and fieriness for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. We are supposed to let God work through those things. It's okay to say, I'm innocent. Yeah. Job did that. He said, I don't know why God is afflicting me. I haven't done anything wrong. And his friends were like, are you sure? Yeah. He's like, I, I haven't done anything. Well, you must have. Or else you would not be going through this. You know what? Good, th good people go through bad stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. That's life. Yep. We may not think it is fair, but it's life. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to be aggravated about that. Yep. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it, you still have to be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. That's the key. That's where godliness steps in. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. That means there are times when it feels like God is slaying you. Yes. Okay. All right. That, that's deep, but it's true. So, um, all right. I've lost my place. Okay, so David declares his innocence. He says, Not for the transgression nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves against or through no fault of mine. And then he expresses his trust in God. Okay, he brings it back home. He's like, you know, they're out to get me. They want to kill me. I didn't do nothing wrong. <coughs> but you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. My merciful God shall come to meet me. And then David ends that chapter with confidence in God. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. He's just snuck out of his own bedroom window. He's running through the night for people who are trying to kill him. He's like, Lord, you are my refuge. You are my power. There is nothing that can come against you. I'm going to sing of your praises. Even though I'm out of breath because I'm running through the night. I'm still going to sing of your praises. Yeah. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises. For God is my defense. God is mercy, or my God of mercy. It shows that a man or a woman after God's own heart, they can sing unto God even in a time of life like David was going through. Yes. I haven't had anybody out to kill me physically. But I've had some people who were determined to make sure that I felt worthless. And they would do anything within their power to make sure that I felt like the scum of the earth just for breathing. And it is hard in times like that to say God is good. Yep. It is. You know he's good, but you would rather pout than say that out loud. He's good, but not to me today. He's still good to you even when you're in pain. Okay. Yep. So David had nothing left he could do. He had done everything within his power to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. And I, I love this. Okay. David has been in the place where he will become king. But not yet. David's learning things in the palace that have more to do with guiding people than it does kingly etiquette because he's learning to love and respect someone who hates him. He's learning to submit himself to an authority that's out of the will of God, that's out of the alignment of God. Whew. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Mm. But he's doing it. And now he has left his covering his protection, the palace, the place where he's supposed to be living. And he had to leave or he would have died. And where does he run? He runs to the man of God. Because that was the only safe place for him to go. Remember Several years ago, Samuel came to his father's house, to Jesse's house, and he said, one of your sons God has chosen. Right. Yeah. And see, David knew that no matter what Saul said, no matter what gossip happened, Samuel knew what David was called to do. Sa Samuel knew about the anointing. Yeah. See, Samuel had kind of lost his place in the palace. He didn't go see Saul anymore. He was 
kind of an outcast out living in Ramah all by himself. And there, there was like a company of prophets that lived in that area. But Saul didn't really have value in the man of God. But David knew that the anointing had come through that spiritual authority, through that leadership. Verse 18, so David fled and escaped and came to Samuel, to Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. Naoth is, um, is not necessarily, it could be a place, but it's more likely, it means residence. So it means that he went back to where Samuel lived. He went back to his home and to the protection there. So word gets back to Saul that David is hiding with Samuel in Ramah, or in Naoth. And he sends messengers to get David. Once again, I doubt it was the same ones who fell for the sick line, but it could have been. I don't know. But he sends messengers to get David. And when the messengers get close to Naoth to get him, to, to capture David, something happens when they get close to where the prophets work and where God speaks to the prophets and where God's anointing had come through, where people have been praying, where people have been reading the Torah, where they had been studying and where they had been focusing on God's presence. When the messengers get close, immediately they are overwhelmed with the presence of God. Yep. They're overwhelmed with what we know as the Holy Ghost. And they begin to prophesy. They're speaking out praises to God and they're worshiping and they're, they're saying stuff that they don't even know what they're saying. They're just praising God. Yep. And so they leave from that and they're just, whoo, thank you, Lord. And they're walking off without David. Okay, empty-handed. And they go back to Saul the whole time praising God. And Saul's like, have you lost your mind? What are you doing? And why don't you have David? And they're like, well, we tried. And Saul's like, y'all are just dumb. Just, I don't even know. Let, let me get some more messengers. And so he does it again. He sends more messengers. And the messengers get close to the, the company of prophets. And they're like, we can, woo, praise the Lord. I mean, we can, God, I can't believe the Lord is this good to us. Uh, I'm trying to get David the Lord's anointed. They can't even get it out of their mouth without speaking praises to God. Right. Finally, they give up, and they're like, the Lord is good, yeah. and they walk away without David. Yeah. Now, I think this is a great time to interject that Saul was not real bright, okay? <laughs> We're just going to leave it at that. He wasn't real bright because he does it again. Third time's a charm. Let's send more messengers. Guess what happens? Same thing. <laughs> Yeah, they get close to the presence of God and they're overwhelmed and they start just prophesying, speaking praises. I can only imagine. Knowing my pastor, I could just see him standing out there going, <laughs> and just watching the whole situation. Like, <laughs> that's three times. <laughs> three strikes, you're out. Come on, guys. You can't just march up into the presence of God and go snatching folk up. That's not how it works. Okay. And so they go back, Davidless, back to Saul. Now, instead of seeing the fact that the presence of God had overwhelmed three of his soldiers or three sets of soldiers and messengers, Saul's like they're all incompetent. If you want to do something right, you got to do it yourself. So he gets his royal stuff on, all of his kingly stuff, because he's about to go in public and everybody needs to know how important he is. This is his identity. He's special. And everybody needs to see it. So he's clothed in all his royal attire. And Saul himself goes to Naoth to retrieve David. We're going to pick that up in verse 23. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah. And the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied, kept going, kept going, until he came to Naoth and Ramah. Verse 24, and he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all day and all that night. Wherefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? 
Do you remember when Jonathan listened to David speak and he felt the anointing and he was like, oh, th these kingly priestly robes, these, these things that make me look like royalty, this is not my calling. David, it's yours. The anointing is yours. You're the next in line to be king. Let me take that off. Let me, let me give you the, the part of my armor that distinguishes me as, as the heir to the throne. He humbled himself and he took his royal clothing off and gave it to David. Saul just marched his arrogant self right into the presence of God, wearing everything that identified him as king. And the king of kings is looking down on him saying, uh-uh, you don't have the power. I do. Your identity is nothing without me. Nothing. Nothing. Under the presence of the Holy Ghost, I don't believe, I mean, it could be, very well be that he was absolutely naked. I don't think so. I think he took off his priests or his royal garments. Yeah. Everything that made him who he was. And he humbled himself, not voluntarily. You see, the Bible says that in the last day, every knee will bow and every tongue That's will right. confess that right. Jesus Christ is Lord. Right. That's right. When Saul takes himself into the presence of God, it was like he was so arrogant he didn't even realize he was standing in the presence of the God who had just breathed life into man and created the world with his voice. Yeah. <laughs> and so God humbled Saul and took off his identity and he lay on his face in the ground all day yeah. and all night. When people say, is Saul among the prophets? It was sarcasm. It wasn't to start with because he did prophesy in the beginning with that host of prophets that came down after uh, Samuel had anointed him. Not now. Now he has no choice. Now he's not voluntarily let the spirit work through him. Now he is having to submit to the presence of God That's right. because he stepped outside of his protection. Saul is now in a place where he has consistently tried to harm the anointed young man. There's a lot of principles in this particular scene. You see, God stripped him of his identity and he humbled him. That seems extreme. But it's always extreme when God has to humble us right, because we yeah. don't humble ourselves. Yeah. That's right. In my almost not quite yet 40 years, I have seen some dreadful, horrible things where God gave somebody the chance, the option, the timing to turn from their sinful way, to repent, to change their life, or to come back to him. And they were arrogant about it. They were like, don't need presence of God. Preacher's not talking to me. Mm -hmm. He's just preaching a good sermon. Right. Only to bury that person the next week. Right. Yeah. I've seen it. I've been there. I've been there. When God gives someone an opportunity and he pulls on their heart and he calls them, we don't need to ever take conviction for granted. Right. I have seen people sit in the presence of God in a service and clipping their nails and <laughs> laughing at stuff, making fun of different things. And I thought, my God, I would be so scared to do that. I can't even imagine being in the presence of God and being so callous to it. But I've seen it so many times. The presence of God, the conviction, that stirring, that godly sorrow that worketh repentance, it's a gift. It is a gift. It is not condemnation. If you can feel that something is wrong, you're not condemned. When you're condemned, that means there's no hope. Yeah. Conviction is a way to change. Right. There's, there's a difference there. It's always extreme when God humbles us. And that's why he counsels us to humble ourselves instead. Right. One of the other... Well... Let me give you a verse on that. 1 Peter 5 and 6. It says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. If you're humble now, 
you'll be able to spend eternity with him later. Yeah. If you let him work in you now and you don't try to push yourself to the limelight of everything, one day you will be in his presence yeah. constantly and you won't have to worry about the things that you worry about and work through now. Yeah. One other concept that we see in this, David has behaved himself wisely in every snare and every trap, every situation Saul's thrown at him. He's handled himself wisely. He has not boasted. He has not been proud. When they came to him and said, you know, Saul's daughter likes you, his response is, who am I that I should become a king? It was all, I don't think it was false humility. I think he was serious. He was like, I'm a shepherd boy from Bethlehem. He was preparing the way for another shepherd that was going to be born in Bethlehem. He had no idea that his humility was going to open the door for so many things. Yeah. David was anointed and Saul hated it. Wanted to kill him. 1 Chronicles 16.22 says this. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. When you step out and start to speak against those that God has anointed, mm, you put yourself in a, a terrible place of judgment yes. and wrath. It's terrifying. Yeah. So the chapter ends, and I told you guys I wasn't going to be long, so the chapter ends with Saul's plans being completely frustrated again. At the end of the last Bible study, he was frustrated because he thought he'd set a trap for the Philistines to kill David, and that didn't happen. And so he had to marry his daughter off. Well, now we see him pushing David out of the palace, thinking, I've got him now. But here's David and his spiritual authority, his spiritual covering, standing on the hill, watching as Saul is humbled in front of everybody, in front of God and countrymen and, and every, cows and everybody. There he is, the anointed one, the little shepherd boy with his spiritual authority. Yeah. You see, when David first came to Samuel, he probably thought, I am so vulnerable right now. <laughs> like, I am with the priest and the tent of meeting, and here's a prophet, and, you know, I've got the presence of God, but there's no big strong walls, and, you know, the priests are cool, and are the prophets are cool and all, but can they shoot a bow and arrow? I mean, their aim's probably a little questionable. I don't know about that. Who's going to protect me? But he didn't. He did the only thing he knew how to do. He ran toward the presence of God. Praise. When logic wouldn't have sent him there. You see, logic doesn't say when you're in a dire need or even when you're not, when something is happening and you've got to make a decision quickly, don't. Yep. Take it to God. Before you do anything, before you act, say, God, I've got to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, I need your help. God, I need you to guide me. And don't put him on a time schedule either. <laughs> Lord, you've got exactly two seconds. <laughs> I got to make this phone call, so you got five minutes, Lord. You got to act in me. Don't put him on time schedule. Um, I called my pastor a, a little bit, a few months ago, and I told him about some situations that were going on. I said, Pastor, I need to know that I am not crazy in thinking this. Do I need to make this particular decision? And he said, well, how do you feel about it? Have you prayed about it? That's always the first question. Have you prayed about it? Yes, sir, I have. He said, are you in a storm right now in the middle of your life? Spiritually, emotionally, physically, he, are you in a storm? I said, well, you know, no, sir, not, not any more than the average middle-aged woman would be. You know, <laughs> everything's a storm when you're middle-aged. Um, I said, but no, sir, I don't think I am. And he said, okay. He said, never make a life-altering decision in the middle of a storm. I thought, well, if ever there's a time you want to make a life-altering decision, it's in the storm. That's why you go buy the Corvette. <laughs> My goodness. But he was right. Most things are not that drastic that you have to make a split decision right then. And that's one thing that pastors taught me. My pastor and, and my husband pastor have both taught me just 
breathe for a second. Because I can think fast. I can react fast. Like faster than I can even realize I've already done it. <laughs> and then I have to figure out what I did. But if you stop and you give it to God first, he will direct your, your path. The old prophet could have told David, what you really need to do right now is worship the Lord and wait on him. Let's have a prayer meeting. But he said, come with me. You see, Samuel had already been in prayer. I don't think it surprised Samuel one bit that David showed up at his house. Yeah. That company of prophets, they had already been in the presence of God, and the presence of God went with them. That's why when the messengers got close, the Spirit stopped them. Yeah. That wasn't the time for the prophets to say, hold on, messengers. Okay, Lord, you remember that time I need you to forgive me for, and mm, let me just work up the presence of God, and let me go back through everything and you've got to be in the presence of God that's why the Bible says to pray without ceasing it doesn't mean that you're constantly walking around saying prayers that means that you keep yourself in the presence of God That's right. because you never know when you're going to have to make a quick prayer yeah. right. let me tell you something that happened when I was a kid and I don't recommend this that's my disclaimer this was a hundred years ago I was in a youth service and one of our local pastors was a young evangelist at the time. And we had probably about 200, 250 teens packed in this building. Like, it was a lot of people. And um, I was sitting, like, on the third row because that's where I was legally allowed to sit. No, we're past that because God didn't move past the third row. And so I was, like, on the third row. And there was a side door up at the, or up the platform. And the minister is speaking up behind the pulpit. And he's just, you know, he's preaching, not really, like, gun ho hollering and yelling, but he's preaching. And all of a sudden, the side door opens, and a man in a mask steps in, and he shoots the preacher. Yep. And there's blood-curdling screams. And, and one guy's like, no! And he, like, drops to the ground crying. The man runs. People run up to the preacher. My heart stopped. Everybody's heart stopped. And after a few minutes, most people just stayed in their pews because they didn't know what to do. This was back in, I don't want, it was in the 90s area, and yeah, somewhere in the 90s. People didn't know what to do. We hadn't seen stuff like that. You didn't hear about shootings in the church. That was uncalled for, unheard of. And after a few minutes, the preacher stands up from where he had been shot because he had not been shot. It was just part of the sermon. And he made this statement. He said, how long will it take you before you get into the presence of God to where you can pray for a miracle? Think about that. In your prayer time, do you have to go through a, a ritual? Do you have to, to go through cleansing your heart and your mind of everything that you knew or you were letting in, but you were just packing it up until the next time you prayed? Because it's easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. Do you have to step away from a Vine or a YouTube or an Instagram video and like recenter your mind before you can talk to God? Do you have to forgive somebody else for what they said about you before you can go talk to God? Because if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. That's that's Bible. That's right. <laughs> We've got to, and that includes ourselves. If we don't forgive ourselves, God's not going to forgive us because we're holding a grudge against His creation. Yeah. <sighs> But you know what? If you've already been in the presence of God and you've kind of got a praise on your lips and, and something happens and the first thing that comes to your mind is a praise and a worship song and not whatever, I don't know. Because you're in the mindset. You're in the, the presence of God already. That's where these prophets were. They had been focused on the kingdom. Yeah. And then when the king shows up, they were able to step into that anointing. That shook me because there have been times in my life where I had to instantly be in the presence of God and pray for a miracle. Mm -hmm. Pastor and I were on our way back to um, Arkansas one time, and we were driving through Memphis, and we came up on a wreck that had just happened, and it was almost surreal. It didn't, it, like you couldn't really even... It was like you were in a dream where there was a median, but there were two tractor trailers that one had fallen asleep behind the wheel and come over the median into oncoming traffic 
where another tractor trailer was coming and they swerved to miss each other and both flipped in the median and threw drivers and whatever everywhere. As clergy, if you come up on a scene like that and there's not an ambulance or a cop or whatever, the scene by law, you have to stop. We would have anyway, but by law, you have to. And so he stopped, or I stopped, or whoever was driving, and I ran to one uh, tractor trailer and he ran to the other. And the tractor trailer's on its side, but it's like the driver's door was hanging open, but there was nobody there. And I'm like, I'm up there and I'm yelling for people and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Traffic's everywhere. It's Memphis. People are all over the place. And I'm like, I'm climbing up. I'm trying to find out if there's somebody in the, the cab of the truck and there's nobody there. And so I'm like, I'm looking around. I'm like, dear God, where is this person? Because if he's in the road, what do you do? You know, I, I, so I'm running around in the median and I finally found this man. It's at dark. It's nighttime. And there's this man in his crumpled body. Oh, it was, it was horrible. And he's laying face first, crumpled in the grass where he'd been thrown probably 25, 30 feet from his truck. Thank God he landed in the median. And I went to him and I started praying. And I didn't even know how. I didn't know what to pray for other than God save his life. I don't know. I don't know. And so he's got his face like in the dirt. He said, please call my wife. And that's all he could say. He said, it's just, he said, find my phone, call wifey. And I was like, dear Jesus, <laughs> what do you do? You're about to call somebody you don't know. Like, and so I, I dug around in the grass until I finally found his phone. And you could hear the sirens coming. And I finally found his phone. And I looked through. He said, it's wifey. So I looked through his phone. And I found his, his title on there. was He had her listed as a contact as wifey. And so I found her. And I told her what was going on. And I prayed with her. And I prayed with him. By the time all the nurses and all these people were showing up. And I put the phone back close to him. And he said, thank you. And I, I stepped back. I was done. Because there was nothing else I could do. In, in a time like that, you don't know, you don't know how long you have. When a gunshot happens, when a wreck happens, when somebody's having a heart attack or a stroke, and instantly you have to call on the name of Jesus. He hears you when you call, but what's going to stop you? Right, Are you right. going to be as um, apt to say, oh, dear Jesus, save this person, when you know you've got junk going on in your life? That's right. That was good. God's not hindering that prayer. We are. Yeah, that's right. So in this story, all of that was a rabbit trail. In this story, I think the emphasis is more on the company of prophets than it is on, well, it is on Saul, but it's more about the people who were already in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Where David knew where he could run. We've got to be a safe place. We need to be the people that gather brokenness, That's that right. people know they can come to us yes. and that we're That's already right. in the presence yes. of God. Yes. We owe our world that. Oh, the Bible says, in the, when he's talking about people being called by the Spirit and coming into salvation, it says the Spirit and the bride say come. Right. That's us. Right. We're the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Right. We've got to have something in our spirit that's drawing people. That's yes, right. Jesus. That means we have to constantly be in the Spirit. David only waited in the presence of God for a short time. It says that Saul stayed there all day, all night, and then he left. Can you imagine getting up out of that ordeal and gathering up your robes and like slowly skirting out, trying to get back to the palace? Saul left, and David waited for a little while to wait and see if Saul's heart had changed. It had not. Saul walked away from that encounter where he was literally paralyzed in the presence of God for at least 24 hours, and he walked away unchanged. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Unchanged. So the week after next, we will begin a new part of the journey with David's life and his purpose to become the king of Israel. Things are bold now. There's no hiding the secret little attempts on people's life. So it's about to get real. David's life is about to get quite uh, interesting. 
So I say the week after next because next week we will not have midweek Bible study um, in preparation for the Thursday and Friday night services. No midweek Bible study next week. Um, we'll pick up the next next week after that. Do we have any questions, comments, thoughts concerning our story tonight? David and Saul. And this also speaks to your testimony. Mm -hmm. What do we inspire in other people? Yeah, what does our spirit inspire? I mean, Samuel and David, every time the prophet, they came, uh, the guys came to get him, they started prophesying. Right, right. And then whenever the, the worst one of the bunch shows up, he starts to speak. Yes. It shows where he was in his walk with God. Right. Where we in our walk with God. Right. Not that we completely ignore what's bad and what's wrong and all that kind of stuff because David was quick to say they're after me I'm innocent don't know what I did wrong but God I trust in you yes. and it was that brokenness and humility that led him to the prophet yes. right. did you have a question yes uh, what do you mean when you say don't touch the anointed so that verse is talking about people who go out to slander the people that God is using or that he has placed the anointing on um, as an example I think it was Eli the priest was bald headed okay this was a couple of chapters back he was a bald man and one day he came out and there were a bunch of teenagers that were like poking fun and making fun of him and he prayed huh was it Elijah, Elijah? Elisha. Elisha are you sure is that I thought it was Eli okay uh, he may be right it was started with an E whoever it was it was a prophet and it started with an E we'll check that in just a minute Anyway, he had a bald head, and the young men were making fun of him. And he came out, and <laughs> he starts kind of like, you know, God, handle this. And a bear comes out of the forest and eats the young men. As an example, that you don't go against and criticize and down the people that God is using. Does that make sense? So if... <laughs> If God has anointed um, someone to speak and to preach or to whatever, and their life is bringing fruit, then you don't go and start making fun of them and ripping them apart and criticizing them and trying to like set a snare to, to you know, destroy them or whatever. But that wouldn't really make sense in the system. No, but our world doesn't make sense. <laughs> and Saul wasn't real smart either. So, you know, that's why he kept sending people out to catch David, even though David was anointed and all the bad things were happening to Saul, but he kept trying the same thing over and over again. So it doesn't make sense. But if somebody does not have God working in their life, it's hard for them to understand when God is working in somebody else's life and they become jealous and malicious and they try to set that snare. And so that's what David is saying in that psalm. He's like, God, I'm living for you. I'm doing what is right. Why are these people trying to get me? Yeah. But God, I trust in you, and you will have your revenge. And God did. Right. So I hope that makes sense. Now we got to look up if that was Elijah, Elisha, or Eli. Elisha. 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 Yeah. Sha. Okay. It was Elisha that was bald. You need to start with an E. Oh, okay. Any other questions, thoughts? All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you, Jesus, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your word and your promises, God. Lord, you are faithful and you are true and you are just, God. And I worship you for it, Lord. God, I magnify you, Jesus, and I praise you, Lord. God, I ask that you would order our steps, dear Jesus. Have your way in our life, God. Use us, dear Lord, and work through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.